Okay, so my parents are born in 1925, and six, thank goodness they're still with me. Oh, it makes me cry when I say that. So all the way up to now, in 2018, we have gained five and a half billion people since my parents were born in one person's lifetime. Meanwhile, our resources are doing this. Okay, so what, it, what does that gap represent? To me, it represents all of our problems, carbon footprint problems, war, disaster, all the things you saw, those disease. And so I can either do this, which is that one guy, plant, he wants to, let's make some more. Meanwhile, this is, you're chasing this, aren't you? You're trying to, instead of doing this, why not try to do this so that we can be sustainable? And doing this is an act of compassion. It is not an act of draconian measures, an act of um, all the things that people will accuse me of being a part of. Because to not work on overpopulation, which we're doing a really good job of, is a disastrous ending. And so, because we're so good at doing nothing, let's have some people do something. Let's have everybody do something and talk about this in a civilized manner, in a compassionate way, and then we could be successful. Schrag is a lifelong environmentalist, naturalist, and overpopulation activist. Author of 14 books, including the book on the issue, Move Upstream, A Call to Solve Overpopulation. Karen is on the advisory board of World Population Balance, one of the leading organizations on the subject, which she's spoken about in England, China, and throughout the United States. To put it bluntly, Karen cares deeply about our planet and what we've been doing to it. Karen, um, we're starting this program. It's going to be an hour long. How many new inhabitants of this planet will we see by the end of this hour? Net gain, about 9,500. And that's every hour? Every hour of every day. One of the people who talks about this topic says, we are witnessing the greatest train wreck threatening civilization. Um, is that too stark a way of putting it? I don't think that's at all an exaggeration. It's an incredibly urgent issue. It's the biggest crisis of our time, not just because of the crisis itself, but because of how it's so deeply ignored. That was going to be my next question. The biggest crisis of our time that no one's talking about. Correct. Correct. Why? It's very hard for people to see that too many people is a bad thing because it's people and we love people and we keep trying to save people and we, keep trying, we have the Red Cross. Their objective is to save people. So the real part behind it that's so hard is that you can have too many ducks, too many geese, too many deer, too many rabbits, and people just can keep being prolific and not have to run against the, the borders of our limits, and they, they don't see that. You have a quote that you like, which comes from Lester Brown, uh, nature is the timekeeper, but we cannot see the clock. Why does that resonate with you? Well, it's so hard for me to not see it. I've been a naturalist my whole adult life, and I can see that nature has a rhythm and limits, and it takes time for her to regenerate all kinds of natural resources. But there's a lot of people who don't live in that world. They live in a world of commerce. They live in the world of homemaking. They live in a world that just does not connect with nature. We don't live on the land anymore. So few of us are farmers, and those of us who are farmers are industrial farmers. And they sit in their cabs listening to the radio while they're, while they're doing their thing, which is really pretty much operating a machine. And what, what we've lost that connection to the land. And so we can't see that the clock is ticking against humanity, against wildlife, because we just keep growing so fast on a very limited earth. And as the population goes like this, the natural resources go like this? Absolutely, because we are apex predators. We are on top of a food chain that's supposed to look like this. We're supposed to be the least amount, and we're the most. To help illustrate what Karen's saying, consider this. Humans make up just 0.1% of all living beings on this planet. But since the beginning of civilization, humans are to blame for the loss of 83% of wild mammals and half of all plants. 
That means humans are literally changing the face of the Earth. Just a few decades ago, rainforests covered much of Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. But humans are cutting down rainforests for cattle ranching at such an alarming rate that some estimates say that within the next century, rainforests will be completely obliterated, totally wiped out. In 1900, uh, the world population was about 1.6 billion. Now it's 7.5 or probably higher. Uh, a little over 7.5. Um, give me a sense. I mean, is there a sweet spot? Where should we be? I mean, how alarming is 7.5? It's 5.5 billion people alarming. The people who are much smarter than me, the global footprint network people, make ca calculations about how many resources we have that are limited. See, there are renewables and non-renewables. And so that is a very measurable thing. And what they say is that living at a European lifestyle, which is less than an American lifestyle, about 1.5 to 2 billion people is the sweet spot. So we can maintain our rivers and our waters and our air and not pollute so much. Because it's not just what we take from the earth, it's how we take it, how much carbon we put in the air, and then what we do with our trash. Because if you and I, an average Americans, we're gonna produce four pounds of garbage a day about. Now multiply that times 325 million Americans, it's a lot of trash. So everything is exaggerated and numbers do matter. Just because each individual might reduce that by a half a pound, it isn't enough because there's so many of us. Um, we hear so many people saying recycle, reuse, uh, all these kind of ginned up, ready to go out there, mm -hmm. save the world. Uh, from listening to you, it doesn't sound like it's gonna do much good. It is good, it's just not enough good. So I don't want people to stop there. I call it downstream. Don't stop doing your downstream things. Don't stop taking those tires out of the river. But you better go talk to the company who's throwing them in the river because every day you're going to go out and you're going to find more tires in the river. And that's what I'm saying. Don't say, oh, look how many tires we got out of the river today. But nobody bothered to go upstream and say, they're dumping their tires in the river. Maybe we should solve this upstream so that we really do accomplish something. So it, it is about getting at the source of problems rather than just always trying to play catch up. Much of the garbage we throw out doesn't break down for hundreds if not thousands of years. Plastics from food packaging to water bottles to straws are one example of trash that stays around almost forever. The Ocean Conservancy estimates that people dumped 8 million metric tons of plastics into the ocean in 2010. That's about the weight of 2 million elephants. The greatest accumulation of all that ocean trash is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is estimated to be three times the size of France. Our fast-paced, interconnected, industrialized world feels far away from the snowy fields of Karen's home. But the fields are enough to make me wonder, this is it. This is all the land we've got. Are we going to run out of space? I don't think when people come out to nature like this, and I know you do it quite a bit, they don't think uh, as we grow as a population, this shrinks, right? I mean, we're losing this type of environment around the world, aren't we? Especially we modern humans. Um, as hunter-gatherers, we were never able to grow that big because we, had, we could see how many people we had to feed. And now it's just completely off our radar screen. We build taller buildings and think that's a good thing. We, we do all these things and we don't realize that it takes time for water to recharge. It takes fossil fuel means fossil means it's not coming back. And we just keep going off what we call the edge of the cliff as if nothing is uh, bad about that. So I, I do think we're not raised with this sort of ecological awareness that was, I think we were starting to in the 70s, but we sure took a detour from that. Why is it so hard to find coverage of this issue? Well, again, I think it runs deep because I do believe that people feel that 
their freedoms are going to be infringed on. You're going to have government control. People always bring up the China uh, issue to me all the time. And I just go, you know, China was a stunning success. It uh, also reduced the carbon footprint. Exactly. But you also need to see this side of the coin. And the side of the coin in overpopulation has been so diminished, kicked under the rug, whatever you want to say in the metaphors, because of its dealing with personal choice. It goes against a lot of religious uh, beliefs, which are still very much ingrained in our society. I'm uh, one of eight. My huh? wife also has seven siblings. I know that we're dinosaurs, but my niece is going to get married next year. She's an only child. Uh -huh. She's marrying somebody, only child. Uh -huh. That's more the dynamic you see now. Right. Why is it we still have this huge overpopulation? People probably can't wrap their arms around it. You know, they, these big families, they're, they're diminished. Why, why so many people? And that's, that is why we, instead of growing by about 95 million people a year, we're now growing by 83 million people a year is because of some of those dynamics. We're not an agrarian society anymore where we need big farm families. Uh, economics has, has made it very expensive to have children. How much does it cost to raise a child in the United States? A quarter of a million dollars to get to be 18 or something like that. Yeah. So we have all of those things going on and that are putting pressure on it. The problem is the word hasn't really gotten out of how seriously overpopulated we already are. And just those trends aren't enough. So reducing the growth by 10 million people because of these trends on a planet that's five and a half billion people overpopulated is like saying, oh good, we get to drown in 30 feet of water instead of 300 feet of water. We're still uh -huh. dead. That was enough time in the Minnesota cold for a guy born in sunny Southern California. We smartly decided to continue our conversation inside by the fire. The world's population could be at 10 billion by 2050. Uh, what kind of doomsday scenario would you describe if, if we hit that number? We're already 2 billion people into having people who have experiencing food and water scarcity. That number is going to rise. So a 10 billion is just going to make everything worse. Um, you're from Los Angeles. The average mile per hour is 27 on a freeway. Why is that? Is it because they're not wide enough? I think last time I was there this year, it was seven or eight lanes wide. So our, our response to traffic is to add more lanes when we should be adding less cars, less people. And I think that everything you can think of will just be exaggerated more storms, less food, more droughts. Everything bad is just going to, to be that much worse. It's hard to imagine. Our carbon footprint is the amount of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gas emissions we emit into the atmosphere, whether it's driving, eating food that requires fossil fuels to grow and transport, or using electricity that's run by fossil fuel plants. In other words, to live in the world is to emit greenhouse gases and further warm the planet. So if the world was less populated, what would it look like? What would be the benefits? We'd have more wildlife, less pollution, more resources, more space, less traffic, less disease, and less wars. All the things that we, we say we want, you know, peace on earth. How do you have peace when you're scrambling for resources? And I think the next will be the water wars, fighting over war, over water. You know, the Great Lakes were in, in the Midwest, they say, oh, they're coming for your water. You know, well, that's all that kind of stuff. All that stuff melts away because there's perception that there's enough. Back in 2014, uh, the Los Angeles Times did a series called Beyond Seven Billion, an extensive series on, on overpopulation. It's five years later. Uh, I defy you to find anybody who's committed the resources to do that sort of thing. Uh, it's just not a story reported on. So how frustrating is that for you? On a scale of one to 10, it's about a 50. I really am frustrated. I, I look at uh, this last um, election and um, 2.3 million Minnesotans voted in it, which was a very high percentage of our 5.6 population. But when I was born, 
That's how many people were in the whole state. Now, Minnesota didn't get any bigger. It didn't get any more lakes. It didn't get any cleaner rivers. But we're not seeing that as a, that's an OMG moment. Oh, my God. In my lifetime, that's doubled. And we wonder why, gee, I'd love to go get a cabin on the lake. There aren't any more for sale. They're all taken. We have to talk about the way the earth works. And the way the earth works is slowly, and it cannot accommodate our waste, our plastic, our fossil fuel. It can't accommodate what we're doing to it. You have an opportunity here to connect with viewers who yes. are watching this. Yes. What would your message be to them if they want to make a difference? Because all of us play a role in this. Open yourself up to the possibility that what I'm telling you really matters and, and learn about it. Become an expert on this issue and you will become, I believe, an activist. Take it to your heart, not just to your head. You have to really feel it deeply. You have to feel it in your gut. So I will tell anyone watching in this audience that overpopulation needs to be on our lips every day. It needs to be talked about with everybody. And let's get rid of all of the venom that's attached to the issue and really unpack it in a way that can help the planet. That I'm hopeful. I think people can do that. They need a little bit of courage and encouragement. Tell them to write me. I'll encourage them. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you.